I'm Nuria Oliver, and I am General Co-Chair of the Pervasive Health 2017 Conference. The core focus of the conference is the development of new technologies and human factors that are at the intersection of computing and well-being and healthcare. The exponential growth in the adoption of smartphones, the exponential growth also in the development of wearable devices and Internet of Things devices is enabling us for the first time in our history to monitor ourselves and to get an understanding of ourselves in a 24-7 manner. And this opportunity is leading to a shift, an unprecedented shift in healthcare, moving from episodic healthcare to continuous healthcare, from reactive healthcare to preventative healthcare, and from genetic healthcare to personalized healthcare. And this shift is enabled thanks to a lot of the work and research that will be presented and has been presented in the Pervasive Health Conference. In recent years, there have been significant and a lot of advances in the area of mobile ubiquitous and pervasive health. First of all has been the massive adoption of smartphones and the development of thousands of mobile apps that enable millions of people to have a better understanding of their well-being and their health. This advance has been accompanied by the development of affordable wearable devices, armbands and watches and even smart clothes that also enable us to monitor certain physiological signals such as respiration rate or body temperature or heart rate and also activity signals such as how many hours we sleep or how many steps we give in the day in such a way that we are able today to monitor ourselves in a continuous manner. There's also been tremendous decline in the cost of DNA sequencing in such a way that um, today we can sequence DNA for less than a thousand dollars and the expectation is that we'll be able to do it for a few dollars um, such that everyone in the planet will have the DNA sequenced. All these different advances are generating massive amounts of physiological and biological data that wouldn't make any sense and we wouldn't be able to uh, leverage it if it wasn't thanks to the development of signal processing and machine learning techniques that are able to make sense of this data. This is another critical element to be able to leverage the technologies related to health. Another area where technology is having big impact is in the context of monitoring and stimulating our brain in a non-invasive manner and in what is called brain-computer interfaces or brain-to-brain -brain interfaces. Today we can already control drones or wheelchairs or even prosthetic limbs just by um, monitoring uh, brain activity and thinking about uh, moving them. Um, there is also great advances in implantable chips uh, and what is called uh, labs on a chip. Uh, this has been for many years, implantable devices, for example, cochlear implants to help people hear, people who don't have that, that, that ability, but the development of novel implants and novel chips uh, that can enhance some of our abilities or monitor certain physiological signals is tremendous. But all these advances obviously have uh, or come with many challenges. There are a lot of technical challenges, but there is also a number of human and societal challenges. From a technical perspective, it is difficult to interpret all this data. Um, a lot of this data is coming from different sensors and there aren't right now uh, clear and easy ways to merge the data from, you know, say, different wearable devices. Uh, there is still a lot of advances in um, machine learning that need to happen to really exploit the value of all the data. There are some more uh, hardware issues related to battery consumption or the reliability of some of the sensors. And the human factors are also very important, particularly as we have and we developed an increasingly intimate relationship with technology. We need to make sure that these um, 
technologies are easy to use that people can interpret in a scientific way uh, whatever you know is happening with their bodies and, and their activities and uh, also um, sustained usage. Uh, one of the critical limitations right now is that at the beginning everyone is very enthusiastic about wearing different uh, self-monitoring devices but uh, roughly after six months the use declines sharply because people encounter difficulties in wearing them is uh, cumbersome and also they might not see the value because it's very difficult to interpret all this data that is being captured by the devices. Another challenge is related to the privacy and the security of the data. This is probably the most private data there is. It's data about ourselves, about our bodies and at the same time as we are developing the technologies to capture all this data, we should also develop technologies that ensure the privacy of the data and the security of the data. The lives of both patients and practitioners will be greatly enhanced, improved and simplified thanks to the existence of all these technologies. From a patient perspective, the quality of life could be vastly improved if you were able to monitor 24-7 important activity and physiological variables for whatever the condition of the person is. We need to take into account that with the aging of the population, the prevalence of chronic disease is increasing worldwide and we won't be able to cope with um, this challenge without the use of uh, pervasive technologies that will enable us to monitor uh, people with chronic conditions in a casual way or in a way you know, that is in their homes, not in a hospital. Practitioners can also see their job greatly improved because instead of ac having access to information about their patients in an episodic manner, only when they go visit the doctor, they will be able to have information in a continuous manner, being able to better understand what's going on with their patients, how they are evolving, how they are responding to treatments, are they really doing the, what they're supposed to be doing in terms of sleeping or eating or exercising and so forth. So I think both for all of us and for uh, experts, for doctors and practitioners, it's an extremely exciting time of opportunity. I have very high expectations for Pervasive Health 2017 and I think it's going to be the best Pervasive Health ever for multiple reasons. First of all, its location. It will be in beautiful Barcelona, a very interesting and alive Mediterranean city with plenty of art and architecture and excellent food. So I think all the attendees and participants in the conference will really enjoy the location. Secondly, I think uh, this topic is becoming increasingly important and there are more and more research efforts working on relevant topics and therefore I think that the conference will be able to attract both a lot of submissions and of uh, very high quality. So I'm really excited to see the content of the conference. We also have lined up excellent keynote speakers that will make uh, the conference even more attractive. And last but not least, I think it'll be a great conference because of the organizing team. I am honored to be co-organizing with Mary Cherminsky from Microsoft Research. We have an excellent team lined up from our local organizing chair, Alexander Matic, to our uh, program chairs, Mirko Musolesi, Andrea Grimes-Parker and Gillian Hayes, all of them very experienced organizing conferences. So I'm looking forward to seeing all of you in Pervasive Health 2017, because if health is to be pervasive, 2017 is the year for it.